Welcome back to Too Much Future, the show where we play the Fallout games and we talk about them. I'm Cameron. I'm Michael. Michael, this episode we are... It's episode 33. I, mm -hmm. I might not have said that already. I've been working all day, you know, and we uh, we got all kinds of things going on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've been cutting steel all day. Uh -huh. I've, I've been uh, going through the same two animations over and over again. And, you know, they say the best art actually reflects life. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm also being eaten by some sort of flesh-eating, FEV virus mutated nuclear phenomena. Put on me by the people who uh, live up in the Sky Towers. Yeah. And I'm personally, uh, I spent all day being lost in the Sky Towers, walking back and forth across vertiginous uh, bridges, uh, trying to figure out where I'm supposed to go. So, wow, in, in you, that way. Yeah. You live in Minneapolis? <laughs> no, I live in the pit, because wow. that's what we're talking about today. Wow. Take that, Minneapolis. <laughs> you and your sky bridges. Get on the ground. <laughs> Use your feet, Minneapolis. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're in the pit, which is the second DLC for uh, for Fallout Three. I and I didn't look. I don't know if you have it in front of you, but um, I wanted to look and see when it came out. Uh, Do you know? I not not specific date off the top of my head, but it would have been like two thousand nine, spring two thousand nine, I believe. Mm hmm. Yeah, March 24th, uh, 2009. Mm -hmm. Exclusivity for a long time on the old Xbox. Um, yeah. Oh, well, it's looking like on the fallout.fandom.com wiki here, uh, the pit's first release, for some players, the add-on was broken and unplayable due to missing, missing textures and freezes. Uh -huh. It was released the next day. Ooh, but yeah, exclusivity it didn't hit the PlayStation Store until October. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking up... Uh stuff about the other dlcs actually today and i noticed that broken steel was the first dlc that was released for the playstation store so they got them in a different order than the sort of like official release order oh that's interesting um i will say too just looking here at this uh, wiki that the poster for the pit the bethesda banner that is posted here is perhaps the ugliest piece of art <laughs> related to a video game i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm going to choke. Oh, God. This is... Hold on. Let me send this to you. Oh, okay. Hold on. Everyone can get this in real time, and you can you can paste it in the... Uh, uh, or one of us can paste it when this episode comes out. Just just uh, click on that old link that I'm giving you, Michael. I want to hear your real-time reaction to this piece of uh, key art here. <laughs> it looks like it was thrown together in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> It's like a and stock photo of some some smokestacks, right? Some cooling towers or whatever. And then it's just the pit in completely unadorned impact font. <laughs> and then the Fallout 3 uh, downloadable content logo. Yeah, maybe it's not real. Yeah, maybe it's not real. I hope it's not. But if it is, who oh boy? Who oh boy? Yeah. Well... Um, uh, how'd you get to the pit, Michael? Uh, well, like all of the DLCs, it starts with a radio broadcast. Um, I don't remember what this one is called, but there's a guy who's talking on the radio on your pit boy and he's like, Hey, um, I need some help, uh, about some raiders or whatever. Please come help me. Um, come, come, come find me. I'm, I'm in the North of the map. And then you go do that. And then he gives you a whole bunch of more exposition. I assume it worked out the same for you, unless there's some weird way of activating this I don't know about. This is not related to anything you just said, but do you think that they, uh, do you think that Pip Boy comes from Pet Boy? Uh, why not? I mean, you get the little, the little vault, vault character kind of uh -huh. looks like a Pet Boy head. He does. Mm, the deep lore. <laughs> The yeah, weird but... and terrible ways that our timeline has diverged. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I had a similar deal where I just like clicked on a little thingamabob and it led me far to the north. Mm -hmm. And then I met like a little pirate. 
Yeah, he does look like a pirate. Uh, he's being like attacked by some raiders, and you can like kill them, and then you talk to him. His name is uh, Werner, uh, and he is like, "Oh, thanks. Like, I need help for what he calls like my people." Um, and he says he comes from a place that's far away, that's filled with uh, radiation, mutation, and disease. There's, it's a really bad place. It's awful. Uh, also, there's slavery. When he says my people, he is referring specific specifically to the folks uh, who are enslaved in uh, what used to be Pittsburgh and now is a place called the Pit. Uh, and it doesn't sound like a great place. No, it's a bad one. Um, I began playing this episode. People who are seeing the footage already know this, but uh, I started playing this episode in third person. Okay. Just to see what was up with that. Uh huh. It's an interesting game to play in third person when you have when you're a melee character. Yeah. Because it's it's kind of like you know just like a bad. Well, I mean this is the Bethesda experience, but it's just kind of like a bad third person you know <laughs> RPG, right? Where I'm just kind of like heaving my thing around, and it's actually kind of a little bit easier to to aim my uh, melee weapons and whatnot. So people are going to get a little bit of you know if you if you've got questions about what you're seeing, that's what what people are seeing right now. It's just me experimenting. I played, I would say, 95% of this in third-person mode. Helped with the precision platforming that comes later. I'll tell you yeah. that. Um, it's very, well, I, I was going to say it's very funny. It's not really funny. It's weird that the uh, best way, or the only way to get to the pit, because he says, hey, come to the pit. Or, uh, you can help me out. You can help me free my people because mm -hmm. there, there's a cure. You can help us get the cure. Oh yes. Um, but it, because there is some a disease, mm -hmm. sort of a sort of like, special disease. Uh, yeah, that's like hurting er everyone in the pit. Eventually, gets. No I'm, I'm glad that we're sort of having trouble articulating this because uh, it's going to become very clear, like sort of what this is in a little bit. But the way that Werner, like I, I had this weird experience of like Werner was an exposition NPC, but he was only giving me like half exposition. I had this there was this weird way in which I didn't really know what the hell was going on because <laughs> like the, the cure thing comes out of nowhere and he hasn't even really explained what the disease does. He's just like, there's a cure. And I'm like, a cure for what? What are you talking about? And he's like, it's bad. Just trust me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's really weird, but he says, hey, uh, people won't believe that you're, like, with me, or they won't believe, you won't be able to infiltrate the pit wearing your good clothes, so you have to take a slave's clothes. Mm-hmm. And the, the, that's, like, the normal slave outfit that we all know and recognize. Yeah, and, but they don't care about your hat, so I ended up running around kind of like, looking like, uh, Lord, uh, was it, like, Humongous, whatever his name is, from <laughs> <laughs> the Road Warrior. Yeah. Um, because the, the quote-unquote slave outfit is just, like, leather bondage gear, um, uh -huh. like many of the outfits in this game. And, uh, so, yeah, so I was, like, running around with that, like, my recon helmet on, <laughs> just, just doing whatever. But you, ha you kill a bunch of slavers, and you free some slaves, and then you, uh, he says, hey, here's a train, here's a little train track trolley. Get on the trolley. <laughs> yes, and it's, like, one of those little, um, oh, I can't remember the name of them, but it's the, the ones where it's, like, two guys stand on either side of the little, uh, jack, and they, like, pump it back and forth, and, like, that's how the little train cart moves. Yeah, it's it's like Bugs Bunny would use this. Yeah, uh, or Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> what if they do? Uh, and yeah, you like get on it, and uh, the screen fades, and then you come back, and you're in Pittsburgh. Uh, can I ask you just very quickly? Um, did you get the glitch that I got when when taking out those uh, slavers? Mm, oh, <laughs> you shared a glitch on uh, on YouTube of th they all had the same face. Yeah. So the, the little slaver encampment that uh, Werner sent me off to check out, like all of the slavers spawned with the same face. And it was like not a right face. Like it's not the face that character. It's not a face that a character in the game would have. They actually they all looked like Sander Cohen from Bioshock. They did. And my they first... looked like Sander Cohen and Butch. Like some yes. sort of some sort of uh, anamorph between the two. <laughs> my my initial thought was like, 
are these guys from the pit? Is this is this the weird disease that he was talking about that apparently makes people mutate? Because that's what we find out, right? That there's like it's a mutation mm -hmm. disease. Um, but no, I think it was just a glitch. Um, so yes, and then you uh, bamf into Pittsburgh, and uh, oh, if you're like me, um, Werner has this dialogue where he says that like your friend can't come with you because I had Fox with me, mm -hmm. like a companion. Um, and then Fox, like, immediately teleported back to the Museum of History. Well, he knows he knows how to get back. Yeah. I mean, he's good at directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I should yeah. say, also, mm -hmm. uh, if you've listened to this show before, if you've listened to Too Much Future before, you know how Eleanor feels about slavers. Um, so just be prepared for a little bit of uh, chaos, Eleanor, throughout this episode. Uh, let's continue. Yeah, well, so, and, and let's just go ahead and knock this out. Let's talk about this first before we get there, because this is, the whole DLC is about slavery. Uh-huh. Right, which Fallout has tried to talk about before. Mm -hmm. Um, This, I, I'll, you know, you tell me if you think I'm, uh, you know, if you land somewhere different here. This, this DLC manages to fail in the exact same ways to talk about slavery as all the other ones. It's like they looked at the formula and just replicated it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this this DLC feels extremely Fallout, and I'll probably reflect a little bit more later about that. But, like, in one way it feels very Fallout is that it has a big uh, goal. I, I think it's a goal that it sets for itself, and then it just doesn't do anything with it at all. In fact, I'm going to read the marketing copy here because mm. I think it's extremely funny. It's like the most 2009 shit. The pit allows you to travel to the post-apocalyptic remains of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and become embroiled in a conflict between slaves and their raider masters. Explore a sprawling settlement ravaged by time, neglect, nuclear radiation, and moral degradation. The pit is filled with morally gray choices, shady non-player characters, new enemies, new weapons, and much more. I, I know that there are many things in here that are worth pointing to and which are, after having played the DLC on face, both false and hilarious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the one that I like the most is that it specifies it's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like We don't want them confused about which Pittsburgh it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it could be any of them. Not, not famous uh Pittsburgh, Nebraska. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pittsburgh, British Columbia? No way. <laughs> it's Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, there are no morally great choices. Or or perhaps there is one morally great choice to be made mm -hmm. in this whole thing. It's not chock full of them. Um, I guess there are some shady characters or morally gray characters, although you can also just have direct conversations with them that really makes it black and white pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess there, I mean, there are slaves in their Raider masters, but it's the type of, of, uh, slavery that we've seen over and over again in fallout, which is that the political imagination around slavery in the fallout averse is that it is 100% a political phenomenon, right? And it, mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with, like, any other mode of social existence. So, like, it is just a question of some people decide to dominate other people and they have the power to do so, and then they make them into laborers. Mm -hmm. And anyone who reads literally anything about slavery in any real-world context, even in, its, in its, you know, a classical form, right, Roman slavery, that's not how slavery works, right? Mm -hmm. There are complicated relationships of um, citizenship and personhood and, you know, the openness to violence and all kinds of stuff like that. And the Fallout games are not interested in thinking about those in any kind of way. And I get why, they, why they're not interested in, because those are thorny issues that are difficult to deal with. But it is really weird to me that you would use the rhetoric and, like, the fantasy of slavery without dealing with any of the actual things that are involved in slavery. And so maybe just do literally anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, get some druids in there. Like, think about <laughs> druid shit. Like, you're more <laughs> successful at that, Fallout, than you are at thinking about slavery. 
Well, and uh, the other thing that's really like annoying about this, and I got some of this from Werner, but I'm sure you got some of it through dialogue as well. Um, when I was having my little like, you know, I'm Eleanor, please give me all the exposition you can conversation with with Werner. He mm -hmm. talks about how, oh, yeah, then like the place I'm from, the pit where all the slaves live and I want you to come back and help me free the slaves. Uh, it used to be a lot worse. Uh, I'm actually like, actually, the slavery thing is, is, an, is an improvement. And this is a thing that the characters who are enslaved are written to say, like, over and over again. Oh, my God. In in like, um, I mean, because so here's the lore for the pit. This will become important. Mm -hmm. uh, the bombs did not hit Pittsburgh. Uh, I guess it wasn't or they didn't hit it directly. Right. It wasn't considered of uh, importance in that way. Um, but basically after the, the war, it became uh, a sort of allegedly the right this this refuge of just like raiders and, and like cannibals and so on and so forth. Uh, but then there was this thing called the Scourge. So when the Brotherhood of Steel sent out their detachment uh, for the East Coast, the, the detachment that's now headed by, um, well, it's still headed by Lyons in, in D.C., but when Lyons mm -hmm. and his team are coming through, uh, they pass through Pittsburgh, and they do this thing called the Scourge, where they just, like, slaughter everyone in the city. Uh, and that is like and then after that is when this like weird like social system with all like the slavery and stuff comes about after the Brotherhood of Steel comes through and just like decimates all of the raiders that are like warring for control of the city and then they move on. Wow. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that Werner says, because he was around, I guess, before, like he was a kid or something right at this time, is he was like, you know, it used to be a lot worse. Uh, uh, yeah, there's this kind of, uh, I guess, imagination that uh, order is, or some order is better than pure chaos, and slavery is at least order. Mm -hmm. Right? Would you say that's the kind of logic being deployed? I think so. Uh, and I also think uh, what is interesting about the lore here is that it relies on us believing that, like, somehow, like, Pittsburgh like that there weren't actual people like living in Pittsburgh. Somehow it was just like all equally evil Raider clans. <laughs> you know, this is really weird because that's the exact thing that happens in the last of us as well. Yeah. You, you, you We're going to talk about the last of us, aren't we? <laughs> well, why else would we talk about the last of us? Oh, I don't know. Tune into the episode, tune into the end of this episode to find out. Oh, okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, but the, but yeah, they go to Pittsburgh and that's when they like discover hunters, these like pure mm -hmm. chaos agents, right. Who are, who will kill and murder anyone. And there's something about Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so we, we get here and there's like a little encounter that happens at the very beginning of this place, um, where like two people come up to meet Werner and I did not let that conversation happen. I just rolled up and, and killed them with my electric sword. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm swinging around all the time. It is like a lightsaber, <laughs> just <laughs> whipping it around. Because I'm of a same, of a similar uh, vibe to you. Like I'm not going to deal with this, like you know, horse shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not playing this game. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, I killed them immediately, and there was no problem with that. And then Werner says, "Hey, uh, you need to run in here now. You need to go to the uh, little zone. You know, you need to go into where." I don't know, like it's like the safe zone, I guess, of of the pit, the pit proper, right. yeah. uh, and uh, you know, get captured or whatever, and then uh, go meet a woman named uh, Medea, mm -hmm. and she'll give you the next quest objective, basically. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So that means, well, you get this leads you into kind of your first big set piece, right? Which is coming across the bridge into Pittsburgh and. Uh, seeing all that which i think is pretty cool the the okay here's here's a weird crossover you ready mm -hmm. for this extremely weird crossover in the stand miniseries uh-huh where am i gonna go you wonder uh -huh. <laughs> in the stand miniseries the bridge and or, or not the bridge i'm sorry the tunnel that they use bridge and tunnel the tunnel they use 
uh, that, that's supposed to signify the Lincoln Tunnel, right? Obviously mm-hmm. not the Lincoln Tunnel. That is in Pittsburgh. I'm hmm. pretty sure that the the bridge that leads to the tunnel that you kind of come kitty corner to in this uh, uh, at the beginning when you're going onto the bridge, I think that's the same like weird little tunnel intersection as is filmed <laughs> in the Stan miniseries. And we're talking about the 1994 like the, miniseries. The 1994 miniseries, yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Check out our show, Just King Things, where we talk about the novels of Stephen King in publication order. Yeah, I might. I, I'll put up a, a a comparison on Twitter. People okay. can uh, can determine themselves. But I saw it, and I I even like kind of wandered back around. And I was like, oh, hold on, wait a minute. This is <laughs> this is where Larry was going. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah. So you, I actually really like this bridge crossing. What do you think about this? I think it's really cool, and uh, I was going to say, like, now we're getting into, like, going to places in Fallout that I've actually been before. I was going to say, forgetting the fact that I've been to Washington, D.C. multiple times. (laughs) (laughs) I just did not care any time, I guess. Uh, But, uh, yeah, the, like, what was striking to me about the bridge is, so it's, um, you're coming into Pittsburgh from the south, uh, and Pittsburgh sits at the, uh, where two rivers join together. Uh, so you're crossing over what I think is supposed to be, like, the, uh, Monongahela Bridge, or the Monongahela River. I don't know what the bridge is called, because there's a couple of them. Um, but, like, as you're coming into Pittsburgh, you'll see sort of, like, downtown Pittsburgh up ahead, and then across the river on the other side are these very steep hills, uh that i remember very well because when i was in pittsburgh for a conference once i got stuck and i couldn't get like uh because of the way their public transit system was working i could not get money onto my bus pass so i had to like walk up these extremely steep hills to where i was staying uh and i i saw those in the distance and i was like yeah i remember walking up something that looked kind of like that uh and it was it was a nice little moment of acknowledging that pittsburgh is in a very hilly area because after this point, it's just all flat in a way that is totally not the case. Uh, uh, yeah, they were like, we should include this, but not in a serious way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like the bridge is nice because it's it's atmospheric, right? Because uh, it's, it's littered with all of these broken down, like burned out cars because people were trying to leave the city during the war and its aftermath and everything. And there are... Uh, like mole rats and some raiders that will shoot at you. There's all sorts of mines everywhere. Uh, it's 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 like I said, it's a nice little set piece. It's a nice little set piece. Yeah, I liked I liked walking over it. I thought that was pretty. I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it worked. And then when you get toward the end, you see a bunch of like escaping slaves running towards you, mm-hmm. and they're being pursued. Yes, and some of them get exploded. Uh, I guess because they ran over some of the mines. Yep, unfortunately. And, uh, and you can, you know, you, I guess, approach the gate and they think you are a returning escaped slave because you mm-hmm. like, couldn't get over the bridge, basically, right. is, the, is the idea. Right. And theoretically, at this point, you've switched into your, your like, slave garment. Uh, but I did not do that. Why would I do that? I'm standing out there in my Abraham Lincoln hat and my power armor. And he like, you know, they're like peering through the gate and they're like, ah, it's one of those slaves that escaped. God, <laughs> yes, God, the this game's doing a lot. <laughs> is what I'll, I guess I'll say. Um, this is also the place where we learned something fascinating that I wasn't aware of, uh, which is that everyone in Pittsburgh has a Brooklyn accent. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's amazing. I had no idea yeah you're like taken in by this guy like it's i mean they're all like weird new york tough guys um, <laughs> yeah, every single all... one of them yeah well, <laughs> I, not a single yins among them right no like, no, no not one not a uh, promonte brothers sandwich in sight <laughs> not a single pirate or a penguin <laughs> yeah so i like i i you know eleanor she comes in and there's this and they're like wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> you you might not be an escaped slave. You appear to be someone wearing power armor and Abraham Lincoln's hat. Uh, and so I just, you know, pull out my gun and I start shooting all of them. I kill them all. So are you telling me you didn't do a single quest in this DLC? 
Is that like what, uh, how we're getting around? Is this how you're going to break it to me that I'm the only one who knows what happens in this DLC? <laughs> oh, I wish I wish we could have done that. I was actually hoping that's how this would turn out, but it's not. But mm. uh, we can continue. I yeah. So I killed all these guys, um, and then you get to the main door, or like that. This is sort of like the you know the little like uh, quarantine area when you first come in. I kill all of these guys. And then I go in through the main door into the pit and there's a new guy there, you know, more and more types of guys. This guy's name is like uh, Red Up or something. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's like, whoa, did you think we were just going to let you waltz on in here after you like killed our guards? And the game like locks you in place and this scripts it such that you you can't escape. Uh, and, you know, you have a little back and forth with this guy where he's like trying to get you to surrender. And then I chose an option that was something like... Uh, I am going to find you and kill you. Uh, that was the dialogue option. And he's like, <laughs> whatever, get her, boys. And then uh, all of his little dudes come up and start like whacking on you. And it fades to black because they've beaten you up and you are now unconscious. Uh, then I woke up like after that fade to black, I wake up and it's uh, this woman looking down at me. And who is it? None other than Medea. And she's saying they beat you up really bad and took all your stuff. Uh, come find me at my house. Wow. Yeah, it's a very different. I mean, I, I guess not uh, at the end of the day, it's the same, but yeah, conceptually very different from what, what I did uh, because, you know, I, I already had my garments on and so I went in and so it, they're like, hey, get to work. And then I'm cut free to, to run around and do whatever I want, but I have to actually go and find Medea. And so, you know, unlike you, I'm walking past the like, uh, like, I guess furnace hole in the ground they've got going on where people are cutting uh, steel mm -hmm. with these big saws. I meet a woman who like will heal me. She's like a doctor and she'll mm -hmm. heal me. I see. So I just kind of get like a, a vibe for the area and that's really it. There's like people wandering around and uh, you know, I've got my map marker to get to and it's not a very big area, but it, it is very different than like getting beat up and waking up somewhere. I actually have to walk through this space before I can meet Medea, but I met, I meet her and then she kind of, I don't know, she kind of gives the, the lowdown on the whole area, right? Yeah, and it was very similar for me, honestly, because uh, Medea says, like, they beat you up really bad, come find me at my house. And then I also walked around and got a, a feel for things, um, met most of the same people you did. I actually went in the exact opposite direction, and I wandered around in the foundry for a long time. Uh, this is a thing that Werner tells you is that uh, how, like, whatever power structure has come to be in the pit, they're firing up the old uh, foundries, right? They're building things. But what are they building? Who knows? Uh, and then I, you know, went and talked to Medea and she tells you, uh, I don't know, a couple of things. Uh, she's like, we need to get you the Asher has the cure. Asher is the guy who runs the pit. She tells us some guy named Asher, Lord Asher. Um, and she has a plan to get us or like the, the, the goal is that I need to get to Asher into proximity with him and steal the cure from him because somehow he has the cure for this disease that's, you know, ravaging the pit uh, and has some sort of degenerative effect, right? People, uh, something Warner says is like the people sort of like lose their reason. And uh, some of them, we meet them outside of town. They're called wild men uh, because I, I don't know, <laughs> but they're just like, I don't know, a different version of a raider. Uh, but then beyond wild men, there are these there's hints that something else is going on. And that's what we need this cure for. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I need to keep a low profile. So she orders me to go to the steel yard and pick up steel ingots, which is and this is how she describes what it is normally, quote, a death sentence. <laughs> so it is. She sell, like that's she tells me it's very important that I need to keep a low profile because the guards will kill me. <laughs> but also the 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 thing she's gonna have me do in the meantime is a thing that regularly gets people killed. <laughs> so I and don't really And she I even says that it's so deadly that they have to they are forced to elect someone to do it. Yeah. Which which is bad. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, oh, there are all these there. Um, she says there's, you know, there are things that live out there, uh, trogs. And you're like, are those like super mutants? And she's like, I, what's a? She says, what the hell's a super mutant? Um, which is nice. Uh, that 
that was actually uh werner had a line that i think is probably specifically to uh fox because fox is a super mutant and he was like whatever your friend is uh so that's nice the idea that no one in the pit has heard of super mutants no one has any idea what they are and you just every time you try to bring it up they're like what are you talking about a super what <laughs> um then uh so Medea is telling me all of this stuff and as she's doing it suddenly one of the guards from outside enters his name is Jackson uh and you know I I know the score Eleanor knows the score like I am you know doing like weird little plotty things with a, a fellow enslaved person here uh when I was talking to Werner before I went into the town, I asked him, hey man, you know, is there anything you could do to help me? And he gave me a concealed pistol that mm -hmm. is still in my inventory, despite the fact that they took everything else. So Jackson comes in, I whip out my pistol, and I blow his head off. I did the exact same thing, <laughs> but, but with a knife. I was like, uh-uh, I'm not, I'm not having this happen. Uh-huh. I'm not, I'm not getting, uh, you know, this whole operation messed up. And uh, I did that, and then Medea freaked out mm -hmm. and began panicking and running around and wouldn't interact with me anymore. And I thought, oh, no, I have messed this up somehow. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after that, I thought, well, actually, I, I looked at my saved games and realized I would not saved in a while. And then I thought, well, I guess I'm just pushing forward. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, and uh, luckily, it all ended up fine. But, uh, yeah, I had the exact same instinct was like, I, I'm not letting this get out of control. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saving everybody's life. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, and I, so I had to look up what happens here. And apparently he just like talks to her and then leaves. <laughs> oh, well. like she's just like, oh, we're just we're just like we're, we're talking about slave things. <laughs> it's OK, it's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, and he just leaves. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, I killed him. Uh, and then I you know, talked with uh, Medea a little bit more. Um she explains a couple of things that are going on. One is that uh, things are things have developed such in the pit that the pit is actually importing slaves. Uh, so the the slave population of the pit is not people who are like hanging out or like living in the pit. Right. These are people who are being brought in largely from the capital wasteland uh, hmm. because they need uh, more people working, working the foundries, I guess. Um, Medea also talks about, uh, this, the precise quote from her. She, she was born, I think after the scourge, but she says, oh yeah, it's bad. But quote, I can't imagine what it was like before. Um, which is, is just a wild thing to, again, for the person who is like, we're, here's our plan to like help everyone and stop slavery to say, uh, yeah. but yeah, she, she sends us off and, uh, did anything else happen to you on the way to the steel yard? Nope, I just went to the steel yard and some rough and tumble jackass was rude to me the whole way, telling me I was going <laughs> to die. Um, I met very briefly this girl who asked me to look for her like boyfriend. I guess his name was um, I think Wild Bill. Um, he got sent to the steel yard on a previous expedition and hasn't come back. Uh, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for him. Uh, and in the little foundry that you have to walk through to get to the steel yard, I ended up meeting this guy named Brand, who's like the, he's, he's one of the slaves who's working, uh, the foundries and he is the snitch and he will like, he, 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 he tells you this, right? He's like, oh, you're new here. Well, like I, you know, pass, uh, in useful information up to the bosses if you know it. Uh, and you can like tell him everything. <laughs> like you have the option to just walk up to him and be like, I am like here from the capital wasteland and I'm going to free the slaves. <laughs> uh, and if you tell him wow. any of this, uh, you lose karma because you know, you're informing against the, the slaves, I guess. Uh, but anyway, what yeah, a, there's what a, a guy great moral choice. Yeah. Wow. Mm hmm. Uh, there's the, the guy who's a jackass to you about, uh, Oh, but <sighs> Does he? Well, before that, we we got to get the um. Oh, what the hell do they call them? The 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 cutter things. Did you get this? No, I didn't. The like oh, auto axe thing. Yeah, the auto axe. No, oh, I did not. Didn't. As far as I know, I did. I didn't receive one. Oh, okay. So an auto the auto axe is something I got. Uh, it's a it's a weapon type that is unique to this expansion. Um. I think I got it because I asked Medea. I was like, so you're sending me into the steel yard, which is certain death. 
And I just, you know, wasted most of my bullets on this guy who walked into your apartment. So what, what's the idea here? What am I supposed to do? And she's like, go talk to Marco, who's this other guy in the foundry. And when you talk to him, he is like, uh, you know, here's, here's my auto axe, which is just, it's like this thing that he claims to have invented, right? This new weapon that he's claimed to invented. And also he'll tell you stuff that like he, he is sort of like a tech guy who is building tools and so on. Um, and sort of stuff that he says basically is that like he, he's trying to come up with things that he can sort of like squirrel away for an eventual slave revolt. Mm -hmm. So this uh, auto ax is one of those things. And it's just like a, a sort of like spinning blade that you hold and like, it's like kind of a saw blade and you just like press it into things. And what's weird is that everyone in the foundry is using these. This appears to be a normal piece of foundry equipment, not some sort of secret thing that Marco came up with, but whatever the idea i guess is that because all of your stuff was taken away you're going to get this uh sort of melee weapon um that doesn't require ammo or anything it also glitches all the time it's one of those things where uh if you use it it makes you like you know the the blade revs up and starts spinning and there's all these sound effects for it but uh when you put away the weapon the sound effects don't stop <laughs> uh and sometimes i got i don't know if this is in my footage i don't remember if i cut it out but i got this weird glitch where i put it away but my hands stayed up in the in the position <laughs> as if they were holding it uh great stuff great great bethesda jank here mm -hmm. yeah that's uh excellent the yeah. uh yeah, the uh, the way he's turning it into a wep weapon of war, of course, is that normally the saw has one of those uh, sensors on it where if human flesh gets near it, it turns off automatically. Oh, yeah, he's yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, he's just rewired it so that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> the flesh sensor was disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a good thing that you get it because I don't remember the name of the guy who takes you out to the steel yard because he's just like he's you know as you said a jackass uh, but there are like these things crawling around you're like walking through kind of these like uh, uh caged in hallways and there are things crawling around uh above you and underneath you and he's like yeah no those are the trogs and then you go out into the steel yard and um you you meet the trogs which is what the people who get this weird the pit disease right whatever we want to call it uh they turn into trogs, which are basically just the subterranean cave people from the movie The Descent. Yeah, they are, kind of. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, and uh, I actually was able to read a terminal later on, and uh, I think uh, like 10% of people who get the disease or who have it, everyone who lives in, in the pit will eventually get the disease. That is established. Mm-hmm. And 10% of those people will just straight up turn into trogs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so they're just murderable, you know? Yeah. Like the first thing you see is like this guy who's talking. He's like in a little caged in area out in the steel yard, which is the steel yard is just sort of this big open area. There's lots of train, uh, like old trains on the tracks and so on. Um, there's like a guy in a, a little fenced in area who's trying to talk to a trog that's coming up to him. And he's like, Billy, Billy, it's me, your brother. Don't you remember me? And the trog is just like, blah, 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 blah. I'm a cave person now. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, and uh, I, I assume it would kill him. Um, but what mm -hmm. I did is I opened I unlocked the gate that I guess he somehow locked behind him. And then that guy ran away and I never saw him again. You think that was Wild Bill? Uh, no, I found Wild Bill later. Oh, okay. I never like... saw that guy. This guy you're referring to, I did not see that. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't even see... I think I only had to fight one trog. Uh, really? It, it, well, yeah, until later when you have to fight a bunch of them. But, uh, yeah, at this beginning part, I... So what I did, I'm in third-person mode. Uh -huh. And so I could, like, look around, and the um, the steel ingots or whatever are very visible. You know, uh -huh. they're, like, they're laying... They're, they're bright gray slash silver in a world that is not that color mm -hmm. and they're and, huge and they're massive. <laughs> yeah. And so I was able to just kind of third person peek around and, uh, I, I did some like puzzle platforming a little bit by jumping from like barrel to barrel. And they're in the, um, like as soon as you come in the entrance, you have to get 10 and there are six in the first, like two trash cans. <laughs> and, and so I got most of them without ever having to deal with anything. I think I killed maybe one trog. R.I.P. Literally everyone else in the pit who has done this, but I'm yeah. different. 
yeah, you should be, oh, you should all live your life in third person mode. <laughs> Uh, I wandered around here quite a bit, actually. Uh, I went into the the little power plant that's here. Did you do any of that? Uh, well, eventually I did because you have to later, but not oh, not at this to? point. You, yeah, I believe so. Huh. I <laughs> wait. So hold on. Uh, when I say the the power plant, I mean like the place with all of the robots and the oh. automation storyline. Oh, oh no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking a... the blast furnace. I'm I'm uh, squashing two things together. Yeah, I was gonna say there's a very interesting little area here in in the steel yard. Well, so I found Wild Bill. He's just like dead up on a roof somewhere, and he has a special gun uh, that is called Wild Bill's sidearm, and he has like a note in on his body that's like, "I'm so sorry, girl, whose name I don't even remember. Um, I'm dying." <laughs> <laughs> like they sent me out to the place where everyone dies, and wouldn't you know it, I'm dying now. Damn. Uh, so I get to tell her later on that I found his corpse, and she's like, well, thank you for like the reassurance or whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's also a power plant out here, and uh, I went through the whole thing. It's filled with trogs. Uh, I got some like pretty good like trog footage of... like. So you, you come into like this big open room on like a catwalk that's suspended over it. And the at the bottom, there's just maybe like a dozen trogs of all types just running around. And they have to go one by one up the stairs because <laughs> it's this narrow little catwalk and it curves around the whole space. So they're all coming up, like stacking on top of each other like frogs. <laughs> and as the, and they don't walk, right? They jump and they leap and they hop. So when they're coming up the stairs, there's like a 90% chance that when they try to jump up, they're not aimed correctly and they jump over the side. And then they fall down to the bottom and have to keep coming up. So I have them all like bottlenecked and I'm just picking them off. Uh, but there's also all of these protectron units that are both outside the the power plant and inside and as is the case with all uh protectron units in this game when you find them you can hack them and like set them on little patrols and they'll fight enemies and stuff uh but one of the things that i was getting also from the terminals was kind of like updates to the employees at this power plant and uh the basic storyline was that the employees, for some reason, appeared to be consistently vandalizing the Protectron units. And most Mm. of the stuff you're reading on the terminals is like little company memos being like, you know, reminder, do not do not uh, vandalize or destroy the Protectron units. Eventually, I got into like the sort of like you you find this like room that's been locked, right? Uh, It's got like a hard lock on it. And I lock pick that and I get inside uh, there's a corpse in here, like an old skeleton with uh, another terminal and a whole bunch of like health and stuff. A little bonus area on the terminal. You find out that this is like the personal terminal of a guy named Tom McMullen, who was the manager of this uh, power plant. And you get sort of more backstory to what you were hearing earlier, which was that the Protectron units were brought into the power plant and the employees did not like it because they thought that the protectrons were going to take their jobs. Luddites. Yeah. Uh, which it, so it's like straight up, like, you know, sort of the Luddite thing, but also confusing because like what they're protectrons, like they wander around and they shoot intruders like, like where there's no indication that these things can run a power plant, but nevertheless, uh, that's what you would think, but you're (laughs) not in the, the wandering around and shooting people business, Michael. Uh, but nevertheless, yes. Uh, it turns out that in fact, the company's plan is to replace their workforce with protectrons. Um, and then, uh, like, this is interesting because this shows up again in Fallout 76. Uh, I don't know how much you know about 76, but, like, one of the reasons that that game did not have any NPCs in it when it first launched uh, was because the entire sort of, like, lore backstory was very much about, like, this... It, it was very much about the fact that uh, right up in the days, like, leading to the war... For whatever reason, the United States had switched to re- like robot labor and automating a lot of stuff. Uh, like this is literally like what Fallout seventy six was about. Uh, and like there were like you can go to places in Fallout seventy six where there were like anti robot protests and things. 
so here seems to be like the anticipation of that where Tom McMullen is like, oh, no, like, yeah, I've tried to explain to the guys, you know, I'm trying to do what I can, but they don't understand. Uh, and if they keep acting up, corporate's definitely going to want to replace them all, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but then what ends up happening is that the, uh, the, the employees at the power plant kind of like tried to strike and then all of the Protectron units uh, activated and slaughtered them all. And Tom McMullen was locked in his uh, office and presumably died there, like listening to the sounds of his fellow workers being killed by the Protectrons. Damn. Yeah. Uh, so that's a fun little story that that comes out here. Uh, yeah, I didn't experience that. I got got my little uh, nuggets and then I took them back. And then the guy said, all right, thanks for these nuggets. Here's a reward. You can go get as many nuggets as you want. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can continue to do this if you want to do, if you want to do it as a mini game of some sort. And I thought, no, this is the ultimate like video game nonsense, right? Where it's like, this is a, a, a death job. You are being, you are enslaved. You are forced to do this against your will. But if you want the best rewards in the video game, you're going to get back out there and fight those trogs and try to collect as many of these delicious nuggets as you can. It's like, good God, man, pick a lane. <laughs> like, pick, like, none of this narratively has any weight if you just turn it into video game horseshit, right? Mm -hmm. um, go and collect the object. It's not Banjo-Kazooie. <laughs> like, like, please keep keep any kind of consistency in, in, you know, the player's head at one time. It's just so deeply, I don't know, mismeasured. Very um, much so. Well, you know what? Uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're pretty far in the show. We haven't really talked about any of the narrative stuff. Um, can, can I just shortcut this next uh, little little thing here? Yep. So you go back to uh, to Medea, and you've burned enough time. And she says, all right, awesome. You need to be able to get into uh, the upper side, uptown. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. Uptown guy. <laughs> Living in an uptown. Fit. Scaffolding. Okay. Yep. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> the uh, so yeah. So she says, um, "You need to do that. You got to get close to the leader of this place, so that we can get the cure." Mm -hmm. What's that guy's name? Asher. Asher. Okay. So he's like the dude who is, uh, you know, keeping everyone enslaved. Mm -hmm. And you. And so she says, "The way you got to go do that is you got to go get in the gladiatorial combat zone." <laughs> Which he has just arena. reopened. Mm -hmm. Finally, they've reopened the, the gladiator pit. And there's just a straight-up gladiator pit. You do three fights. They're not particularly interesting. Uh, they do drop um, toxic waste barrels on you to really give them a time limit, <laughs> which yeah. is weird. Um, but, uh, but I completed those very easily. And uh, they say, uh, wow, wow, you did it. Congratulations. Now go talk to that guy. Yeah, now go talk to Asher. And uh, you get to do that. There's a lot of wandering around to get there. Yeah, this uh, is the part where I just, I got totally lost. I probably wandered for like 35 or 40 minutes because after you win the arena, they also like give you back all of your stuff. But like, I didn't realize the box with all my stuff in it was in that room. I thought it was somewhere else. So I like wandered around forever and got super frustrated. I had this exact same experience. I was running around looking, trying to get to the map marker and like, yeah, probably spent 10, 15 minutes trying to figure it out. And then I literally looked it up. I was like, I'm tired of doing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was in a lockbox right in front of me on the ground. Yeah. Um, on my wanderings, I run into my old friend Redup, the guy who beat me up when I first walked in and remember what I said to him, but the next time I, I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I did. No one cared. <laughs> well, you told him. Yeah. I mean, no, he knew. Like, literally that's in the dialogue choice where basically you can just be like, yeah, I made you a promise. Wow. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. That's yeah. good stuff. 
Uh, yeah, so that that was a little thing that happened. But eventually, you go through all this stuff, and you get to uh, Asher's headquarters, which everyone calls Haven. It's not clear why it's called that, other than I guess it's Asher's Haven. Uh, and it's this massive, massive building, like big Art Deco skyscraper, which I had to look it up because I was like, what the hell is this based on? Uh, it's apparently based on the a building called the Cathedral of Learning on the University of Pittsburgh's campus. Yeah, and it's yeah, been, have you, it's amazing. It's it's been like teleported in, uh, like about I don't know, like ten miles or something for where it actually is to to be in this game. Um, but it, I was expecting more of a story for like why this place, but no, I guess they just decided he was gonna set up shop in the Cathedral of Learning. Yeah, because it's cool. It's probably yeah. the coolest thing in Pittsburgh. And it's got... <laughs> well, unfortunately, unlike the the one in this game, the real one doesn't have a massive wicker man outside. Not yet. <laughs> because that's that's the thing that strikes me, is that you, you come up and it's like, wow, this big skyscraper. And then there's just like this weird wicker man sculpture with like uh, uh, corpses and pieces of bodies in it and it's also mm -hmm. like it's it's a figure of a like a human figure like being chained down which gives me the vibe that like people here are really proud of the slavery thing I guess well think about it this way too um, this version doesn't have a really good vegan restaurant right beside it <laughs> like the real one does you know what? so there's you know fiction gives you some things and real real life gives you other things you know That's you gotta true. keep in perspective anyway, true. call yes. me out pittsburgh <laughs> take that <laughs> uh but yeah so uh you there there are so many characters here like uh red up or whatever his name is he's not the only like little mid-level flunky that you can talk to and i ended up talking to i think probably all of them and they all have names and they all kind of have a little bit of personality uh they're all just kind of post-apocalyptic mad max people right the sorts of people that you would expect to be like the the people in the town who really love uh keeping the slaves in line uh none of yeah. them matter <laughs> You know, I've just put together why you mentioned The Last of Us at the beginning of this episode, like, as you're talking. Because the other thing that this reminded me of is that, you know, The Last of Us 2, the, one of the big things in that game was, like, all of the all of the NPCs you're going to kill have a name. You know, mm. when you kill them, they, it'll be like, uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny, <laughs> are you still over there? And, you know, it's like, no, Johnny's not, because he got murdered. Mm -hmm. Um that's the case of all of these slavers. They all have a name. Mm -hmm. Like all of them. And I mean, that didn't stop me from using my lead pipe and hitting them all in the head with it. But um, it, it felt like a proto moment of like, well, look, if you're going to kill these slavers, you better be willing to kill people who have names. Mm hmm. Well, the, it gets even better because you, you get into Haven, you take the elevator up to the top and you walk in to Asher's office. Um, another thing that I have picked up on, I don't know if you got any hints of this, but the slaves are planning uh, an uprising. Um, mm -hmm. You get yeah. little bits and pieces of that. Uh, but uh, you go up and you talk to Asher and he's talking with one of his lieutenants and he, we, we learn that Asher insists that we don't call them slaves. We call them workers because of d dignity or something. It, it, well, it makes them feel like they could one day be free. Yeah. He says. Uh, uh, you know, so a lot of cynicism here, like like purposeful cynicism. Like you know, he understands the rhetoric that he's involved in. Yeah. Uh. So he you, you talk. He's like, oh well, if isn't my you know new friend or whatever. And uh, the first opportunity I get to talk to him, I can you know sort of talk to him and have more. He he asks you basically, what's your deal? And you can pursue this conversation further, or you can do what I did, which is say, I'm the hero here to kill you and free the slaves. At which point, he automatically aggros you, as does everyone else in the building. Yep, same uh, same road I went down too, but the, uh, so we, I think our, our journey toward the end of this DLC is basically identical. Um, but uh, did you notice the good old Fallout maneuver here? Yeah, the, the classic Fallout maneuver of, wouldn't it be ironic if the person in charge of this vast slavery operation was a black person? 
Yeah, it's exactly the same thing that happens with Fault City. Yep. Uh, the exact same, like, ooh, yeah, the that tone of voice, right? <laughs> like that, that like ironic. Oh, wow. Yeah. W- it would really make you think, wouldn't it? Uh huh. Um, so I think, yeah, currently we are there. We have encountered, I believe, three slavers mm-hmm. in you know three figureheads who represent slavery in the Fallout verse. And two of them have been black. Mm-hmm. And uh, sort of notably, right, the the way that the slaves in the pit talk about themselves, I think, is clearly informed by, like, the history of American slavery and the way that, uh, like, sort of when we talk about, like, my people, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, like, the, the one, like... I think in PC, like Medea is a black woman, um, but like, you know, it's it's a multiracial slave coalition, <laughs> uh, yeah. which I'm not saying that like slavery would not produce some sort of like my people type solidarity, but it's a it's it's a, this is a difficult thing to work through. Um, and the video game is not really doing the work. No, uh, no. I mean, it has no idea. It has no interest uh, in trying to think about the implications of slavery in any kind of way. And I don't think that in other instances of slavery, as we know it, right, in uh, history in a general sense, the the chattel slavery is a different form of slavery than other forms of slavery that have emerged. And Fallout, I'm not saying that, like, a game has to, like, finally, def- you know, define specifically the mode of slavery that they're involved in. But it's exactly like you're saying, right? If you were so heavily... Um, borrowing from the uh, rhetoric around uh, and and the kind of uh, representation of and the history of American slavery, that was not the same as uh, Roman slavery. And it was not the same as slavery in antiquity in the Middle East, right? It's different. It's a very particular form of it. And it's not that old. And, you know, I don't think you can just kind of summon that up out of nowhere and... um, you know, use that as a narrative without being responsible for it in some ways. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. It's it's gross feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, one other thing to mention about Asher that is a, a kind of a big tip off is he is wearing uh, some old power armor. It's like mm-hmm. broken down and been sort of like repainted, and like one of his shoulder pauldrons has been replaced with like a cow skull or something. Uh, because as I, I mean, as I learned, I don't know how this worked out for for talk. Um, and it, as I'm like killing everyone who is uh, uh, now trying to kill me, I'm noticing all of these characters. I'm like, oh, there's this scientist lady here who's shooting me. That's interesting. Bam, bam, bam. Um, I like wander. I wander out of the office like I'm, I'm chasing Asher. I'm trying to kill him because he like shoots me and I'm like, I nearly obliterate him and he goes running. And I chase him into like this little side room that's like this little lab. And that's where I find the scientist lady who's also trying to shoot me. And I kill both of them. Uh, And I'm like, oh, whoa, I'm in a lab. There's a baby here. And like my immediate choice is like, will you pick up this baby? And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. I don't know what's happening. (laughs) Um, uh, But anyway, uh, we'll talk through this. Uh, Well, that scientist coming out of nowhere. uh, (laughs) Like, she was on a delay or something for me, so I killed everyone else, and then she came out of nowhere blasting me with a shotgun, and it was very surprising. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so I pick up that baby as well. Uh, And then I go over, I, like, run, like, I picked up the baby, and there's a terminal there, and you read the terminal, and it's from the scientist lady, and it turns out the baby is the cure. Bam. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, so, well, I'll talk about this more, uh, in a second. I go across and there's like Asher's bedroom or something. Uh, and he has a safe in, in his room and I, you know, hacked it or picked it or whatever you do with safes in this game. And I got some hollow tapes out of there. I also Hmm. lost karma. (laughs) Wow. I I lost karma for, uh... (laughs) robbing the 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 the, ma- the slave master that i killed um yeah. well it's because he was dead yeah <laughs> you should never rob the dead it's, it's <laughs> impolite uh but you listen to his audio logs and they are to the baby who turns out to be his daughter it's a little baby named marie it is his daughter with the scientist lady oh no yeah 
who uh, came into the pit uh, because she was drawn by the the sort of like she had heard that there was a like a sort of stable social structure going on there. And she wanted to be able to put her uh, knowledge to use. And she apparently is very cool with the whole slavery thing. And she wants to solve the problem of the trog disease. And uh, as you learn through Asher's tapes he's he's like explaining to his daughter right like i am like you're listening to this when i'm when you're much older and i hope you understand that your father had to make a lot of dis- difficult choices etc 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 uh but so he and the scientist lady are working together to try to cure the trog disease and as they're doing this they start sleeping with one another and then the scientist lady Uh, has this baby who, by complete coincidence, by incredible luck, has a natural genetic resistance to the trog disease. And so the baby is being studied in order to synthesize from her some sort of cure for the trog disease. Well, uh, that really kind of recharacterizes... um all the people telling me that she would be returned to her parents when we were done. Well, here's the other thing is that like, I was like, holy crap, did this game 100% scoop the last of us? And it did not because the baby (laughs) uh, is she's, she's not hurt. Like they just keep her like the, the choice here, what, like what it comes down to, right. Is, are you going to uh, uphold the existing order of, of slavery um, or are you going to take the slave owner's child away and like destroy that system and get and put the baby into the care of like people who are interested in actually helping the residents of the pit in, in like a broad way rather than keeping them enslaved? Like that is the choice that you make because they just they're going to do the same thing. It turns out is they're going to like keep the baby under observation as she grows up and see what they can do to uh, like make a cure. I don't know. It seems pretty morally gray to me. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? But yeah, so I, and you know, when you, so you escape, you escape with this baby, you mm-hmm. give it to these other people. I, I had to kill a lot of people with, on my way out. Yeah. I would say the vast majority of people, but even weirder than that. So I get there and I give, uh, uh, pirate O'Houlihan his, uh, his baby here. Mm-hmm. And he says, all right, well, you're going to have to go, go down to the power plant and or uh, yeah i guess it's power plant i don't know the other power plant Mm -hmm. and turn off the floodlights that keep the trogs out of haven uptown Mm -hmm. oh oh. and uh if you do that then we will uh then they'll all be dead and we'll be able to like go and uh you know slavery will be abolished at that point because all the people who are in the upper caste will be gone if we let the the monsters overrun uptown slavery will be abolished yeah it seems like you're introducing a real this this really seems like a uh like a you know uh what's the story where eating a spider or whatever and you got to keep eating additional things to eat the (laughs) thing the old lady who swallowed a fly yeah there you go um it seems like that but with trogs it seems like there's probably 15 people left in Haven and we can just take care of that ourselves. But, you know, you go down in this very boring dungeon um, and you flip flip the floppy and you go back up and lo and behold, there's a bunch more slavers now who appeared from somewhere. And now you got to fight them and some trogs and you got to get out of there. Mm-hmm. And you like run through the area and then you get to the right place. And I guess the lights are still on downtown and the trogs aren't going to be there. And, uh, meet up with um you know uh shiver me timbers and he tells you oh yeah Medea's taking care of the kid if you want you know here's a little like standing quest uh bring her teddy bears so you can now like just collect teddy bears in the world and give them to Medea so she can give them to the baby oh that's interesting I didn't I didn't get that one but he did tell me I could go and collect ingots if I wanted to (laughs) <laughs> you could you could go back on the death trip to continue doing the thing that was going on beforehand yeah great yeah I didn't uh, do that. 
Oh, and then also, I maybe this didn't happen for you. I don't know if it's conditional. I think it's a reward for finishing this whole thing. Uh, you can now, like, forge your own ammo in the foundries here. Because that's mm. what Asher was doing, right? His whole plan was basically to build up a military force uh, and become a weapon supplier. Yeah, I was able to do that part. Or, hmm. or, or did learn about that. But uh, you can't forge sledgehammers in there, so it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I'm really feeling at this point that I can't throw a hammer in this game. Yeah, that is kind of sad. Yeah, let me throw the hammer. Yeah. It, we didn't get it until, uh, didn't get throwing knives until Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah, no one had ever thrown a knife before. It was it was actually mechanically impossible in video games until we had, uh, uh, you know, the Xbox Series X. <laughs> Well, is there anything, uh, any other things about this? I mean, that's kind of it. If, if it feels like it, to you as a listener, this just kind of ends, um, that's kind of what happens. Um, it feels like the the Trogs taking over the, the Haven or whatever, releasing, uh, unleashing them, it feels like that's meant to be a bigger thing than it is. And and maybe that is the case if you like leave Asher alive or whatever. But really, for I, I think for both of us, it was like fight your way out of Haven and then go back and fight your way out of Haven again. Um, you know, mm-hmm. kind of a a weird repetition, not really a building on anything. Yeah, no, it's very strange. And I definitely it, it does feel like um, something that they might have planned for, like more scripted stuff to be going on, uh, especially like as as you're walking through, you can see like the floodlights uh, clicking off. Uh, and I could see the idea there being like, oh, the floodlights click off and then, you know, the 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 trogs spawn in and you see the trogs fighting some slavers, but you don't really see any of that. There, there aren't that many NPCs, uh, kind of doing things or anything. You're, I, I remember just walking through and like seeing the lights flicking off and being like, well, this feels anticlimactic. Yeah. That said, uh, like I said at the beginning, this does feel very fallouty in that, uh, it is, (laughs) It is a bad idea pursued as if it were a good idea. Uh, the Because of, one, kind of the topics that it's playing with, um, and two, the very specific ways in which it, it does not do justice to those topics, I think. But also kind of the, it leans into more of the Mad Maxi angle, um, which was more present in Fallout 1 and 2, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really feels like a Fallout 1 and 2, but also the the big... The big issues here in the in the pit really made me feel this. Uh, one of the big issues is that between Fallout One and Two, there's this maneuver that that's that I don't know if it's successful, but it's at least interesting. Which is like, once people begin gathering in large groups in places, weird stuff starts happening. You know, it's like trade routes and things like that. You know, become. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, viable and that that Fallout Two is at least partially about like local geopolitics. Uh, mm-hmm. You know w- what's happening with these these places and how are they growing? And what's weird about the entirety of this Beth- Bethesda game so far is is that it tries to keep that as far away as possible. You know, not thinking even though the plot of the game is is theoretically about you know the capital wasteland and water and kind of unifying all these things or or at least you know doing things that benefit everyone. I, I, you know, the pit is not that. The pit, the pit feels like it is a set of missions that are set thirty years after the bombs dropped, and not you know a hundred plus years. Absolutely. And, and so it's a little bit you know out of time, out of place in that regard. I think. Yeah, and that's why you know I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the the lore about the Brotherhood's scourge and so on. Oh, I I didn't even explain like. Uh, Asher was part of the Brotherhood of Steel uh, coming through, and during the Scourge, he got, like, trapped in when, and when a building collapsed on him, and then he woke up, and it was two scavengers trying to steal his power armor, so then he killed them, and then he became uh, the, the Lord of the Pit, which also, I think, you're supposed to get some kind of uh, Heart of Darkness uh, Colonel Kurt stuff going on here. Uh which also like is there there are other things that have told that type of story better (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh but yeah so that was why i was thinking that the the backstory the lore the the idea that the pit uh for the 200 years since the war was nothing more than equally evil raider clans just seems so absurd because fallout 2 is so clear about the point that like no like people make communities (laughs) 
Mm-hmm. Like communities happen. It's not just like uh, the the war of all against all in perpetuity. Um, and then in some ways the scourge is them trying to sort of reset the clock. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. I don't know. Maybe we'll learn more about that. Maybe that's going to come back. I can't think of like any time in Fallout Four that I learned about the scourge. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but maybe that's just me not remembering. Um, what what's the DLC that we're doing next? What's the next one in release order? The next one will be uh, Broken Steel, the big important one because it is the one that raised the level cap and changed the ending. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna have to talk to uh, Scribe Parsifal or whatever his name is. <laughs> it's Rothschild, actually. Oh yeah, you know the one. You yeah. know what I meant. Yeah. I played it last night. I'm gonna save it for the show, but mm. boy, is it a DLC. <laughs> okay michael where can people find you on the internet you can find me on twitter.com at warren is dead if you like the show you can back us on patreon patreon.com slash range touch will get you all the information it's also down in the description below if you enjoyed watching this video go ahead and smash that like button hit subscribe if you haven't already before and leave a comment any kind of comment it's just for the algorithm it's to let people know that you care it can say uh michael what should they write Write about your favorite Wicker Man. <laughs> like, you have a favorite Wicker Man? Let us know in the comments. Yeah, tell us about your your favorite Wicker... Hold on, let me get my uh, YouTuber voice on. <clears throat> so you've heard about our favorite Wicker Men. You tell us about your favorite <laughs> Wicker Man down in the comments below. I know that each and every one of you... From wherever Wicker Men are from to somewhere else that Wicker Men are also from, have a definite idea of what kind of Wicker Men we should be checking out in our next video. So <laughs> tune in two weeks from now and you're going to hear all about the different Wicker Men's that we have learned about in the ensuing time. <laughs> Hard pivot to Wicker Man only show. Until next time, folks, war never changes, but Fallout does. Except for